Hello everyone, I'm Meena Gopal. Welcome to Global Express. This is where we dissect developments in our neighborhood, in our backyard, and examine how these events impact India. Today, we look at the strategic implications of the crisis on our eastern border. Uh, at India Fears, we'll see an influx of refugees. Uh, on Monday, Bangladesh Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina Wajid, one of the world's longest serving female leaders, was given less than 45 minutes to leave the country. She resigned as Prime Minister and fled minutes before mobs ransacked her home, set fire to the home turned museum with the founding father of the country, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. And in an eerie repeat of what happened in Baghdad Sehri Square, where mobs toppled Saddam Hussein's statue, the most compelling image of all to me was how Sheikh Mujib's statue was brought down in Dhaka's Dangbondi. The Mujib legacy, tarnished, tainted. There's been a bloodbath. Minorities have been attacked. Hindu temples vandalized. Hasina's Awami League leaders have been attacked and killed in their homes across the country. The situation is still evolving. Will Dhaka weather the storm? Or is it on the brink of civil war? Is Bangladesh facing a near implosion? So all eyes are now on our Nobel laureate, uh, Norma Dunis, who's been handpicked by the student leaders who uh, as he returned to Bangladesh and was sworn in as chief advisor of an interim administration, a provision in the constitution that I believe needs a constitutional amendment to restore. So big question, can Yunus bring a measure of calm to the country? And secondly, who holds the reins of power? Is it in the arm, is it in the hands of the army chief, Wakar Zaman, or with the student leaders who are already running up against the entrenched political interests of the opposition Jamaat e Islami, the opposition leader and former Prime Minister Khalid Azia, who's been released from detention, and her son Tariq Rahman, who wants elections in the immediate here and now, so they can catch in on the anti Hasina uh, you know, wave in the country. Uh, talking to us today on where Bangladesh is headed as it, as it falls uh, back on a Nobel laureate, uh, just like South Africa and Myanmar did, are two very highly respected voices. Bangladesh's former foreign secretary, Shamshir Mubin Chaudhary, who's already said the incoming interim government must restore law and order first and bring in a system for free and fair elections before announcing poll dates. Mr. Chaudhary took part in the independence movement and had a brief stint in politics. Welcome, Mr. Chaudhary. We also have a keen analyst on Bangladesh, Dr. Sriraga Dhaka. She's professor of Jindal School of International Affairs, Gopi Jindal Global University, former director of, Global, of Maulana Abdul Kalam Azad Institute uh, of Asian Studies in Kolkata, and fellow with the Institute of Defense Studies and Analysis in Delhi. The professor called for Sheikh Hasina's exit uh, on the very day that, that she was about to uh, that everything blew up. Uh, very, very pertinent, very prescient, uh, Professor. Uh, welcome to the show. So, Mr. Chaudhary, you've called for changes in the system of government. Do explain what that will entail. As for free and fair polls, everyone knows the January polls were rigged, only 40% of the electorate voted. If fresh polls are to be held and seen as free and fair, Will Sheikh Hasina be allowed to come back and participate? Will uh, as her and campaign as her son Sajid Bazid Joy has said she wants to? Uh, at the very beginning, I must say that uh, I strongly condemn the vandalism that has been going on or that has been going on. It is now much more under control. And uh, yes, there was initial fear uh, of the minorities. Uh, and uh, students and madrasa students also actually went and protected many of the places of worship of the minority communities. But nevertheless, this is something not at all condonable, uh, and certainly not in Bangladesh. And I, I feel deeply hurt by by what has happened. Now, uh, I must say, Srirada must be having a, a crystal ball in her front, uh, every, every, even when she goes to sleep. Because uh, mm -hmm. at the very beginning of this thing, she said, she was the only one from India who said Sheikh Hasina must even Bangladesh even before Bangladesh she said it. Uh, the Sheikh Hasina must go. No, and, that Sheikh Hasina must step down or exit the country. No, I said she has to step down. 
exiting yeah, okay. the doctor, I, I yeah. honestly thought, let me just intervene here, that, you know, one, and I kept saying this, that if she did publicly sack her ministers who have hadn't done her much glory, brought much glory, into the two and her some of her other ministers, younger ministers, who really, I thought, were disappointing. And she should have just initially said that in some of my earlier interviews, she would just come up to the students and in her typical motherly way say that, you know, okay, mistakes have been done. Let's let's talk. I she didn't do that. She did a typical politicking thing, and then I I was quite convinced that you know the nobody is going to forgive her for what subsequently happened, and that's when I said step down. Of course, the dramatics of it and all of this I hadn't, uh, uh, but I I I. I I, I've said that everywhere and Ambassador Chaudhary has heard me too, that it wasn't, I think that what I saw the position wasn't tenable, wasn't acceptable, which I thought would essentially lead to her stepping down, uh, not what happened. No, see, what, what, what happened Ambassador was Chaudhary. that, uh, you know, one must remember that the fish rots at the head, the rotting of the fish starts yeah. at the head. So yeah. one can keep on blaming the junior ministers and all that, but she appointed the junior ministers. So she should have known uh, their political acumen or the lack of it. And, uh, you know, when the parents of the uh, uh, victims of police firing and Chhatra League firing yeah. went and met her, Ganabhavan, she was yeah. saying that I feel the pain of a loss of a dear one. That means she was referring to the death of very unfortunate and tragic death of her family members, her father, her mother, her brothers on 15th August 1975. The question that many people are, especially many young women were asking on the social media, has she lost a son ever? Does mm. she know the pain of losing a son? Mm. These mothers feel the pain of losing a son, which is, you know, more painful than, well, not more painful, but as painful. So she gave them some money. What stopped her from sending some ministers over to Abu Said's house? The home minister visited Rangpur the district where Abu Said was killed, but he didn't find time to visit Abu Said's family. He was visiting police stations. He was visiting, you know, those. But the worst thing was unleashing the Chhatrali with all their brutality, extreme brutality, on girls who were, you know, on, in the procession. They were trying, the girls were running under trucks and buses to save themselves. They were dragged out and then they were killed. Uh, they were, they were uh, I mean, horribly beaten up really bleeding young girl, left on the street to bleed. Other students went and picked them up. So this is where I think she made the first mistake. Uh, she did not, she, I think she underestimated or undervalued the power of the youth. And yep. these are the non-political the youth, non-political youth. Anyway, uh, that is so, now... So you uh, would, would, you, would, you, would you say, Ambassador, that the, that the Awami League is virtually dead in the water? I mean, you said rotten fish. Uh, you, I mean, uh, do you believe that they have a chance at all? I mean, why has Joy taken this U-turn uh, where he started off by saying the family will no longer come to the rescue of their country? Now he's backtracked and he said there can be uh, no democracy in Bangladesh without an Amad Awami League. What does that mean? I mean, for <laughs> no, Sheikh well, Hasina I, I think and if, for the Amad Awami if, if Joy said there can be no democracy in Bangladesh without Awami League, I think... He should ask Awami League itself how much it destroyed democracy in Bangladesh. So, uh, answering your later part of your question, uh, the interim government under Mohammed Yunus, uh, I get the feeling they'll take time. Uh, they will not give in to BNP's demand for an immediate election because, as you said, BNP wants to, you know, uh, 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 exploit the anti Awami League sentiments and immediately go for election. I have no, I have absolutely no. Uh, no doubt that the Sheikh Hasina, the uh, Yunus interim government will take at least a year, if not more, bring in some electoral reforms through ordinance by the president. First of all, is to have all future elections under non-party caretaker government. In Bangladesh, our electoral system doesn't work as neutrally as it does in India. Uh, we have a very, very flawed economic system. The party conducts election, the party appoints election commission, the and the results are always, you know, one. 99% of the MPs are from the Awami League. So we have to restore the non-party theatrical government in a different form, maybe, but it has to be done. The second is they're thinking, the thinking of what we call proportional representation yes. you know, in the parliament, which they have in uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, we don't have to go to look at Europe. to do, uh, In our neighborhood, Sri Lanka has a proportional representation. Nepal has proportional representation. 
Now, India has first past the post system, but the Indian electoral process is trusted by the people. The people have confidence in it, as the last election showed. Uh, number one, and then you have federalist states. So your federalism worked very well. We don't mm -hmm. have federal system. I think we should look at having federal, uh, you know, provinces in Bangladesh. Also, Sri Lanka, a much smaller country with a far smaller population, has provinces. Why shouldn't we have provincial government? So those are the reforms I think they will look at before they rush into the election. That's very interesting. The first priority, the first priority is to restore order, public confidence. It is settling down. The police are now beginning to come back to their police stations. Uh, there was a total breach of trust between the police and the public because the police killed 403 to 400 people. Uh, so that is being done. The IGP already has been appointed. The president has spoken to him. Officer Yunus has spoken to him. And uh, then we hope... I was with the Indian High Commissioner this morning for a very long time. He uh -huh. now feels much, he feels much more uh, comfortable now. Uh, he went... They definitely went through a very traumatic first 24, 48 hours. But he's saying that now that the government is there, and he was there at the swearing in of the uh, interim yeah. government. Yeah. And uh, he's saying that uh, we, we know it will give time. And there was a message from your Prime Minister, Mr. Modi. Uh, uh, being in diplomacy, having been a diplomat for 32 years, that was not really a congratulatory message. What he said, I wish you the best, etc., etc. Please look after the safety of the minorities. Yeah. I think. I think the focus should have been to look after the safety and security of all Bangladeshis. Mm. You know, whatever, okay. whatever, religion, whatever religion they belong to. And then he said, we yeah. hope co cooperation and uh, all that will continue, etc., etc. So, But Ambassador, Ambassador, my question basically is that, you know, in the interim, while this interim administration is uh, being run by Mohamed Yunus, who actually holds the reins of power? Is it still the army? I mean, do they have the... Uh, uh, I mean, General Bakar Zaman uh, is uh, supposed to have told Hasina that he could no longer provide for the security, and that's why she left in such a panic, uh, you know, uh, and given that. But what, what now? What, what is the situation vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, you know? Well, uh, uh, what General Bakar Zaman said very clearly, that the interim government will run, uh, you know, the government until the next election. And the military will provide all kinds of support uh, mm -hmm. wherever it's necessary. So I still would believe that the interim government will be running the government. In a very, very abnormal situation that we are in now, the role of the military, of course, will be there, not in the form of martial law, neither in the form of what happened in 2007, 2008, where we had two parallel governments. And there was a military back yeah. there, government, Sridhar knows about it very well. She knows them better than I do. and uh, uh, But General Moin basically called the shots. I, this will not be the case this time. Uh, but, yeah. of course, the interim government will be in touch with the uh, uh, military establishment. And because the Office of the Armed Forces Division is under Professor Yunus himself, which is oh, like Armed Forces Division, which is which looks after the day-to-day -day affairs of the, uh, of the military, Army, Navy, Air Force, all three of them. So, uh, so he will have direct, uh, will be a direct interaction with the armed forces all the time. I mean, the police, uh, the military is providing a lot of security now, a uh, lot of safety arrangements that the military are doing, but you know, they cannot do traffic policing in the street. That is the mm -hmm. job of the police. So this is a bad uh, period we're going through, a difficult period we're going through. A student, young girls, you're very impressed when you see these young girls Absolutely. and boys on the middle of the road, trying to control the traffic in a very polite manner. No mm. rudeness. They're not. They're not collecting money from rickshawalas and bus bus drivers, but they're not trained to do this job, and they have to go yeah, back to yeah. the universities and colleges sooner rather than later. Yeah. Evolved, but one, of, one, but one very interesting thing there. Looking into the future, yeah. I think wanted to look into the future. I was very impressed with a bunch of uh, young students, uh, boys and girls, you know, having coffee in some of the cafeteria, and they were saying, "We want to see an academic atmosphere in Bangladesh." Where Chhatru League or no no where Chhatru League nor Chhatru Dal should be allowed to be present, which is amazing. We this she what she said was really what touched our heart. This mm -hmm. is the new generation of students. They don't want Chhatru League or Chhatru Dal to come and take over and play 
havoc in the universities. You know, so they I don't want, want a politi politicization of the students. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm very impressed with that. And I guess she was speaking for the whole student group. And I was very, very impressed with that. And uh, so we have to wait and see uh, uh, a little longer. Uh, they were all in today in the National uh, Monument for the War Martyrs. And uh, one thing I would demand of Professor Yunus to restore Bangabundu Museum mm. uh, without Monday. any delay at, gov at government cost. But uh, I believe they have. I believe these uh, these uh, young students have gone in and uh, they, stood they outside gone, Dhanmandi. Yeah, they, yeah but they, they have cleaned it up, but it needs to be restored. Yeah. In some cases, the statues of the Bir Sreshto, the seven Bir Sreshtos we have from 1917 were damaged. And you know who did who did all this. We all know who, who did? did all this. These are the extreme, extremists, uh, Islamic extremists. They even tried to name a highway toll, which is called Jatir Pita Bangabundu Ex Expressway. They wrote Jatir Pita Hazrat Ibrahim Expressway. You know, the old Ibrahim who... So they are giving it... And all they who are doing it were our Maulanas, were, that kind of thing. This will not last in Bangladesh. Uh, so are you will... pointing fingers at the jamaat islami ambassador? Uh, they are the ones who don't want idolatry, you know. So they, they will they will do something. Now, uh, Nina, I have to leave. Yes, in a minute thank, you very much. Kolkata... thank you very much. And... I just wanted to say that uh, the, powers, the power rests then with the students. Uh, would, you, would you be... Would they you will say have that? a big say. They will have a big say. They are the ones who lost their lives. You know, students. So there's a generational shift that is taking place in Bangladesh. That right is something Bangladesh. That, that is something Bangladesh needs to have very soon. Yeah, yeah. Very soon. Th thank talk you very to your, much. Talk to another time. Okay, bye bye. Sorry okay. for that. Thanks, thank you. So the inside story of the last few minutes of uh, you know Hasina's uh, stay in uh, in Dhaka itself seemed to have been uh, you know uh, a moment when uh, you know everything that she stood for, everything that we Mujibur Rahman legacy stood for seems to have been dashed. Do you think that they should be able to, even if they have elections, that the Awami League will be able to actually uh, reclaim some of that? Uh, and what do they have to do to do that? I do believe that if you want a multi-party democracy in Bangladesh, which I'm sure the students want to see, they would also want to see Awami League's presence. But right now, and I think in continuation of what you just heard from Master Choudhury, I think the need of the hour by this particular interim government is that there should be a you know inquiry into the uh, violence that occurred, not only during the run up to the you know the sequence from the protest movement, and also subsequently what happened post Sheikh Hasina, uh, you know, leaving uh, Dhaka. I think that has to be done. The you know the brutality and all of that has happened. It's not something I'm sure Bangladeshis per se support. It's just a group of miscreants, a group of people who leverage that kind of a situation when uh, clearly the security forces have taken themselves away from any controls. If that you know all these people who've done wrong are brought to the book, I'm sure things will fall in place. People will be able to, as you know, we know the sacrifices that the students have done and their families. So you will have to put balm on those pains and those wounds, but that will happen A, once you're should there be Should there be a commission of inquiry, Professor? Yes, something. That, there are many such discussions on about something what has we've seen in Africa and, you know, elsewhere. But, I mean, Bangladesh, again, are extremely creative, uh, ingenious with their ways. They're probably fine. But I think that is, I mean, restoration of law and order, of course, to en ensure that, you know, there's no violence against any Bangladeshi minority or other. <laughs> has to be the first step forward. But then again, let's not forget this phase. So the way you can actually put a closure is by doing a, a proper objective inquiry, a, you know, a commission of truth or whichever way it's called. And then I'm at this point of time, I can't think of Awam League entering the, you know, the landscape. But I'm sure, and I, that has to be the case because uh, Awam League is a large, you know, it's a historical political party. You can't wipe them out from the political landscape. So whenever elections are, and I'm sure there'll be level playing field for every political party in Bangladesh. I'm, I'm sure about that. So going back to this point that Ambassador Chaudhary also made about uh, Prime Minister Modi's uh, uh, comment, uh, do you think India is looking at events in Bangladesh from the right perspective? I mean, we have uh, supported uh, Sheikh Hasina, uh, you know, uh, 
lock, stock and barrel over the last 50 years. But, uh, you know, I mean, is India also overplaying this whole, uh, you know, the whole narrative about Pakistan, uh, you know, say, citing the ISI hand and the ouster of Sheikh Hasina, uh, you know, I mean, surely the genesis of these street protests are very clear. It is in the overreaction of the Hasina government, and it started with uh, unarmed student protests over the reservation issue. Absolutely, what you said, I... I think we are both on the same page on this. This is an internal problem, uh, which you know, a uh, issue that the students in the first few weeks we've saw seen peaceful protests. It turned nasty only when you know it was egged on by prime minister and some of her ministers. So it was, and the nine point demand that the students had you know first set out had nothing which was you know, improper or not moderate. They said apologize for the deaths, which certainly one needed to. And, you know, like these two ministers who were certainly very derogatory in the way, and they talked about Chacho League being able to fix the students. And of course, and they also talked about, you know, revision of the quota system. They never said throw it out, lock, stock and barrel. So the nine point demand was very rational, but the problem was that the government or the political leader was not looking at it. And then subsequently, and then when we saw that the state forces were... Constantly, I mean, it was not one off incident. It started with Abu Sayyid, of course, in one particular year, but across the board, the kind of outrage that happened was clear that, you know, students will not put up with this. With, then it became a one point demand that, you know, the prime minister has to go because it was happening. And I mean, just exactly the point that Masara Choudhury made that if she didn't give the directions, it wouldn't have been possible, right? Security forces, paramilitary forces don't do these things without. Uh, you know, some kind of approval. And of course, I mean, that goes without and, saying. And in India's reaction? And India's reaction? Do you well, have a comment on that? You know, I mean, we've always... And this is something that we've seen in South Asia everywhere. Whenever there is domestic issue, it's always the minorities who are the vulnerable. It happens across the board. It's not only Bangladesh. It happens everywhere in South Asia and elsewhere. So clearly, again, the miscreants and, you know, there are various... I mean, there are extremist groups in Bangladesh, certainly. They obviously targeted that. And again, I would want to say why there is that Hindu-Muslim thing there. I mean, the religious divide. But most of these Hindus are actually targeted because they want the Hindus to leave with the land and they want to grab the house and the land. Simple as that. Okay. It's, it's that Thanks. which works much, works much more. And they're a vulnerable group. I mean, they won't have, you know, thousands and lakhs rallying around them. So which is why anytime there's a bit of dissonance. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah, anytime there's a dissonance, the minorities have. So India constantly harping on that. I mean, I'm, I would think, I mean, I, I do agree that, you know, the entire Bangladesh is, uh, I would say we should look at that in a larger way. But of course, he made a point because for us, uh, we can't get over what has happened in the past. And, you know, that's something. Uh, so where did it morph from the students' protests into a political movement? Do you think that the opposition, jamaat islami and the, uh, Bangladesh National Party of Kaldazia cashed in on the uh, anti Hasina feeling and sort of co opted the whole thing. Uh, no, I don't agree to the co opting a bit. They did not co opt till the last date, even like till yesterday when uh, before uh, Dr. Yunus took over, it was a leader's move, it was a student's movement. What okay. happened was it was the students and the civil society, you know, the they, their families came in, their parents came in, the, you know, musicians, cultural people came in. It was a across the board, a civil society kind of a program. But BNPs or the Jamaats are also part of Bangladeshi, right? They are not outside. Yes. Yeah. So they yeah. as Bangladeshis joined in, but every political constituency will obviously want to leverage. They will always want to fish in troubled waters, which they did. So that this violence that you see post Hasina and the you know whatever happened after that is certainly a creation of those miscreants. But uh, it was certainly not owned by any of the political parties, no matter what they say. It, it remains to be a student's uh, movement. So there was also India placing all its uh, eggs in the Hasina basket. You know, I mean, there was an India out campaign during the January polls. And should we should we accept that this anti-India sentiment uh, stems from our, you know, support for Sheikh Hasina, uh, turning a blind and us turning a blind eye to all her, uh, you know, uh, governments stomping out of all opposition? Would Absolutely. that be accurate? Absolutely. And, you know, the proximity that we've shown, I mean, it's a historical proximity again. 
uh, it goes back to pre 1970s when Awami League worked so closely with India and our political parties here. But what we have seen, and it's it's something that the problem has been that if they're angry with Awami League, it falls on India. And if it's they're angry with India, it falls in Awami League and Sheikh Hasina. So it's been a kind of a catch-22. And, you know, we've never been able to get out of that. Also, I would like to stress this here, that BNP uh, in the opposition in the last decade or so uh, never really endeared themselves in the sense that, you know, they've been criticizing the Awami on several accounts. But in terms of showing that what they want in terms of a vision for Bangladesh, a vision board for Bangladesh, and India's role in that. Nobody denies the fact that Bangladesh is extremely critical to India. Vice versa, India is very critical to Bangladesh. And why would the other political parties not accept that? A problem, of mm -hmm. course, as you just mentioned, that she did many wonderful things, not only within Bangladesh, but also with India and Bangladesh. But much of it was stream road because there was no opposition to questions. So there are many issues on transit, on the recent thing that they signed in, you know, in terms of the train uh, in uh, east, northeast uh, part of India and, uh, you know, but that they were not explained well that what is this particular agreement we are doing. You're saying that she didn't, she didn't, she, she sort of uh, instituted all of these uh plans and programs without bringing the people into taking the people into confidence exactly so exactly so and i'm absolutely sure if there's a proper debate there was proper discussion they would have seen reason as to why she's doing it because it also works in bangladesh's favor it's not as if you know it's, it's all, only something that india wanted but they were not able to you know see that because nobody explained that to them and the high-handedness of this government clearly reflected in many of these measures and policies and would you also say that in not going ahead with the Tista Water Treaty, uh, we've also uh, blundered a bit in the sense we've pandered to our, our uh, you know, voters, but uh, also sort of not given uh, uh, Sheikh Hasina the chance to sort of, you know, say that she had pulled off something. Which is very have, I, I've been community. studying Bangladesh for a few years now, and I have ad nauseum written about this, uh, spoken about this, that no matter what we do with Bangladesh, lines of credit, cross-border facilities, the one most emotive factor for Bangladesh is water, continues to be water. But despite the fact in 2010, we said we look at Ganga, you know, Gan, you know, it's a basin management, we look at other rivers. No, there's been some progress, but we didn't sign anything. Even on Tista, there's many occasions when I've spoken at, you know, different platforms. But I'm saying that even today, the Tista water is flowing into Bangladesh. It's not, it's not, it's not a stop. But let's on that basis draw up some agreement, something, which we did. We we failed to understand that Bangladeshis are so emotive of a particular issue and we didn't take that into uh, consideration. I think that's a, been a huge mistake. Yes. The other the other thing which which strikes you also is that India didn't keep communication lines open with Kalidas uh, uh, and by the BNP. Uh, you know, it uh, turned a blind eye to the fact that Tariq Rahman was, uh, you know, poisoned with all those cases that he was sent into exile. Uh, should we have, even though they we all we also uh, have come to the, uh, uh, I mean, sort of see that during Kalidas uh, you know, reign. Uh, there was a lot of, uh, you know, stuff that was happening in the Northeast, in our, uh, in our states. There was, uh, you know, terrorist attacks and all kinds of things that were happening, which we, so we couldn't really trust her. Uh, to, to... I agree that 2001 to 2006 phase was the worst ever because the kind of security attacks were done on India from Bangladeshi soil, all of that. But subsequently, and I do agree that I, I mean, I would want to argue that the Bangladesh of that time doesn't exist anymore because they've seen the difference of working with Bangladesh, with India. And again, BNP, and I know some of the BNP leaders have been in and out of Delhi and all of that, but there has never been a cohesive voice from BNP saying that, okay, so this is what we think about working with India. This is what we want to do. This is what our you know vision is, what our ambition is, what our aspiration is. That something was missing. Just few leaders. So should, that change? Should, should, should India now uh, understand the importance as we have in the Maldives, where we have reached out to uh, Muizu, the President Muizu, and, uh, you know, 
uh, built some uh, communication uh, lines even in Sri, Sri Lanka itself with all the various parties. Hundred percent. We now do the same in Bangladesh. No, hundred percent. percent. We should reach out to you know every player that's possible. I would also like to add here that I always got a sense that you know uh, Awami League or the I mean I would say the Prime Minister herself was never happy about India engaging with any other player. I think I I got a sense of that. I mean I don't know why I'm saying, but I I you know you know me I mean I'm not a Bangladesh very often. Uh, I got a sense that she rather have India work only with Awami League, but that's not the reason why India wasn't, I mean, I, I'm sure that India would have found many ways to uh, engage, not officially, but any other way to engage with, you know, opposition players. And BNP is, again, a large, you know, constituency there, has a large constituency. Why are we not uh, taking that into consideration, ignoring that constituency? And again, I would say the fault also lies with BNP. It's a mutual problem, I think. BNP didn't do a proper outreach with India, and India was very, very binary in their choices in Bangladesh. So Delhi may have learned a lesson from this. Uh, possibly, maybe they will reach out. We don't know. But there's also a lot of talk about uh, what uh, Professor Yunus, uh, Dr. Yunus, will bring to the table. I mean, he did decline the offer. Apparently, it was made to him some years ago when he was asked to front, the, front an organization and uh, head the government. Uh, he declined. Uh, why did he change his mind this time, I wonder? Was he pressed by the army? Was he pressed by the West? And he and Hasina are sworn enemies. I mean, there's been a lot of uh, uh, nasty back and forth between the two of them. Uh, and I'd really like to know why Hasina saw him as a, did she see him as a threat? It seems so. I mean, I, I wonder why, because she, she did seem as a politically competitive or something like that. But in this case, as to why Dr. Yunus agreed now, I would probably go with the fact that he probably saw what the students had done. And I think this is, is you know, engagement with students. I think he, you know, he's been a, a personality in Bangladesh that everybody looks up to. He's aspirational, right? A Nobel laureate like that, and the kind of work that he has done across. So that's something I probably, he he saw what students have, you know, the sacrifices. He didn't want to let them down because from what I hear that he was the unanimous choice of the students in terms of leading this mm, particular year. Right. And especially the two students who, leaders who were inducted into his team. Yeah. Nahid Islam and Asif Mahmoud Sajib yeah. Mia. So, both, so both it's, these it's, very young, youngsters are, uh, you know, are going to play a role. Uh, yes, in this particular interim. But if you, I, I mean, what I've noticed over the last, you know, few weeks, the kind of maturity the students have shown in various interviews that have followed and all that, it's amazing to see that, uh, you know, the kind of a vision they have for Bangladesh. So I'm extremely upbeat that, you know, as to what they bring to the table, they are constantly now asking for an apolitical, accountable, free and fair uh, a government that, you know, gives a level playing field for everybody. And I think they've, they've seen a lot of uh, dark things happen in Bangladesh and they want to really literally get rid of that past. And they hope... You that, know, is, to... that is interesting, but I also, I mean, I personally feel that it's a bit naive because you're dealing with entrenched political parties like the BNP and the Awami League and, and the Jamaat Islami. I mean, uh, I mean, we don't know who's going to call the shots, really. I mean, could this not be manipulated, uh, you know, by the political parties? I mean, the, the student leaders will have to really dig their heels in. I mean, we could have uh, an, another army coup, possibly. Who knows? Or, or a or a Khalid Azia proxy, you know, her son Tariq Rahman uh, is uh, is planning to come back. I don't know how they'll make that happen. So, you know, will the will the opposition, including these student leaders, be able to work together? See, at this point of time, the neutral government, the caretaker, the interim, whatever they're calling it, will work because everybody is putting it together. They want to make it work, but this is not a long term solution. They'll have to look at. Uh, you know, again, a level playing field for every multiple party to come in and see how uh, a democratic... So you don't on. see a return to military rule? No, no, no. I don't see. Uh, I, I hope I'm not wrong on this, but I do not see because Bangladeshis will reject a military uh, leader. For sure. They want the military to provide them with safety, keep their borders secure, ensure, you know, rule of law uh, is maintained, but they don't want certainly to see a military leader as their uh, premier. No, not at all. No, no, one, one of the former diplomats who served in Bangladesh during uh, uh, Mr. Eshad's uh, uh, time, 
also to, told me that he was he was uh, reminded of that time because Hasina was basically told that the army by the army chief, just like Ershad was told by his uh, army chief, that he was not willing to go and fire on any more student protesters. You know, but it seems to be cyclical in Bangladesh, don't you think? I mean, there you have elections, then you have a coup, then you have, a, you know, military rule, and then you have elections again. Do you see, do you see this, uh, this repeating itself? I agree political leaders uh, have not had a great track record. I mean, every political leader has manipulated the system, whether it was Khalida Zia during her time, or uh, whether it was 96 when you know re-elections were done in three months and even in 2006 we've seen how she manipulated the system and i mean the last 15 years we've seen this particular prime minister do the same so clearly political between you know Khalid Azia and sheikh hasina it hasn't been a very clean uh government's governance but hopefully and as i'm saying i hope the sacrifices of students don't go in vain uh, they don't want to see that they certainly want to bring back uh, uh, fully robust uh, democratic norms and standards back into the country. Let's hope for that. Now, the, the other interesting thing is about uh, Joy himself. I mean, there are unconfirmed reports that Joy's financial de dealings and uh, assets are being investigated by the US, and they're said to be disproportionate to his income. Hasina is supposed to have asked the US to desist, and apparently that is what soured relations with the US, uh, and it made it worse when the US and UK critiqued the January elections, you know, claiming it was a fraud. I mean, we brought up this in our last discussion uh, where we talked about how Hasina had, uh, you know, had accused an unnamed power of wanting to carve out a Christian nation from Myanmar and Bangladesh uh, and alleging it was a threat from a white man. Uh, and the unspoken charge was that she had not given into the US requests for a military base on St. Martin's Island, and that's why her time was running out. Do you uh, think any of this is true? Because now Hasina will not even get asylum in the US because they've cancelled her uh, visit visa, you know? So where, where do you think she's headed? I mean, especially now that Joy is saying that she's going to come back and fight the elections and campaign. I mean, I'm sure she's a political person. She may want to come back. But of course, I'm I'm sure there'll be charges brought against her also, as I'm saying. Uh, you know, if one anybody looks into the few year, weeks of violence, there'll be serious charges against the person who brought, you know, allowed that or actually wanted that uh, kind of a repressive. So system. why would she come back and face something like that? So I don't know in that sense as to how that will work out in terms of the, you know, uh, the charges that she faces. But I'm sure Awami League is going to be a player in the political landscape of Bangladesh. But how, and you know, all these years we've also heard about how the son wasn't wanting to come back. But I just saw a tweet, I think today or um, early in the day that where he says that if Bangladesh is want, if it, you know, if Awami League needs me, I will be there to join their hands. And like, That's so right. he's probably trying exactly. to launch himself. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, uh, in in South Asia again, family uh, hierarchies are you know typical. Family legacies continue, uh, wrong or right, whichever way it is. So if Bangladesh is wanting, that's fine. I mean, but again, as you talked about the corruption issues, uh, it it's safe to say there are very few political leaders in Bangladesh who are not tainted with corruption. Uh, it's across the board. It's not only the Awami leaguers, of course, because if you stay there for twenty years, clearly. You have access to much more resources and ability to, you know, soak in all of this. But uh, uh, corruption is is a kind of an inherent problem amongst the political class in Bangladesh. That's I'm very sure, interesting. I'm sure that's another thing that the students would want to uh, see cleaned up. In fact, that's what brings me back to the students. Where, where did she go wrong with the students? I mean, did she get bad advice? Was she, uh, you know, sort of not open to uh, what was happening around her? What, why did the students also not back down, even in the face of bullets? I mean, they stood their ground. Where did that come from? Was it deep-seated anger or fear that if they backed down, they would be sitting in jails forever? Yes, I think it's a combination of the fact that she wasn't willing to talk to them and when she expressed willingness that was far too little too late uh, and the the fact that on unarmed students you've unleashed your state power you know state forces uh, how is that ever acceptable and on demands which i'm still maintaining were extremely moderate extremely sober 
So it wasn't as if they are saying that, you know, we want a problem, there's a problem with the government. They're willing to talk, they're willing to. But the fact that in broad daylight, the shootouts that were happening, how students have, you know, pelleted down, that something didn't go on. And I've also, you know, in a different context, I've also been told about this word Junoon. That's something, I think, the kind which happened, I mean, you know, it's, I mean, we've heard many conspiracy theories sitting here about how so many players from outside has egged this on. But what I saw, the images all across television and elsewhere, uh, this expression of anger, of resentment can't be uh, doctored. It has to come from within. And uh, I think the students, the, you know, some of the young students that I heard over many of these interviews were also part of the one who had that, remember when there was a um, bus accident and they had the reform, yeah. uh, road safety reforms, they were part of, so they had some experience in terms of how you deal, uh, you know, and usher in some reforms which is much needed. So there was and the sense of maturity that I found in students was, I, I've been very impressed. And I think it was a kind of a overwhelming moment that, you know, no matter what the you know government does, we will face it all together. I think this all together was something that, so you see students connected from private universities, public universities, and across, it was a nationwide protest, right? It wasn't confined to Dhaka. So clearly the fact that we are all together, we are in it together, was something that, you know, made them fearless in the face of brutality, I would say. That, that, that's a very interesting aspect. It's the first time I've seen it. And also the Indian business community, they've also faced a lot of heat. Uh, you know, although it is the Indian business community, some 7,000 businesses apparently are run by uh, Indians. They have run a huge uh, successful garment industry and, uh, you know, and yet uh, there are photographs, uh, you know, that there's supposed to have been a photograph of uh, Sheikh Hasina meeting with uh, uh, you know, with her army chief and with uh, two Indian uh, Indians, whether they were from diplomat, uh, the diplomatic corps or whether they were advisors, we don't know. But that's supposed to have been uh, like a red rag to the bull. But to go back to the uh, what Khalida Zia did uh, during the uh, you know during her 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 regime, do you see her as uh, you know making a comeback, and will that then color and sort of imperil India's, uh, you know, eastern border with Bangladesh? I mean, will it, will it open the doors for Chinese sort of to play their, their little games there? Uh, Khalidia Zia herself, uh, we are hearing, is very unwell. I don't think she herself is in a position to, you know, be the leader here in this case. Uh, and we don't have a very good uh, history with the son who's sitting in London. And even if he does return, we are hearing a lot of talks and whispers about him coming back. But as I said, our history with BNP has been pathetic. Uh, we are very wary that uh, what they will do if they are back. But again, I would feel that that Bangladesh of that time doesn't exist anymore. This is a Bangladesh where the younger generation wants to be with the rest of the world. They don't want to be seeped into, you know, anti any country's, you know, activities. How does it help them to do anti-India activities? I mean, that's the bigger question here. And at that point that's of time... That's a actually, because the, the Indian universities and Dhaka University have got a lot of synergy. Yeah. And, why, you know, they're coming, going constantly. I mean, there's a lot of... I mean, I wouldn't think that, of course, whenever there's a bit of soft soil, whether it's Pakistan, whether it's China, somebody's going to find, trying to, you know, look for that trouble spot. But by and large, I would believe that Bangladeshis uh, wouldn't want to go back on a path which didn't bring them any honours, right? I mean, what did they gain by doing that? Did, did you know, what, did the people bring them back? Uh, did anything happen which was positive in that experience? So I would think they would have gone past that and now re rebuild ties with India because it's, it's a the neighbourhood where everybody needs to work together. I think that interconnectedness of the region is something which is not lost on the younger generation. And I would hope that that is what will carry the India-Bangladesh bilateral through. And what does Dr. Yunus bring to the table? Can he can he sort of effect an economic turnaround? I mean, would he be able to uh, have that trickle down effect, which brings benefits to the poor, like he did in the like he did with with his uh, you know his amazing uh, bank? So, the way I see it, Bangladesh till at least a year and a half ago was doing fabulously well. You know, they were one of the fastest growing in Asia and all of that. The kind of 
downslide that we saw happening was a lot of his own internal making. While there was, of course, but pandemic and there is, of course, the Ukraine-Russian war which affected, but much of the ills and the problems of the economic downturn in Bangladesh, which is which we see just now, which includes the forex, which is down to 18 billion, so basically three months of survival, will need some serious handling and some serious reforms and some serious plans of restructuring their financial architecture. That is something I'm sure Dr. Yunus with his team will be able to, you know, look at much more deeply, which unfortunately the previous government just wasn't. I mean, corruption has reached the roof. Bangladesh always has been known to be a particular corrupt nation. But what we saw in the last decade and plus was something, again, out in the public domain, brought out by some very, uh, I would say, brave journalists and people. But the government wasn't giving any attention to that. So hopefully with all of you know, the problems, which are, everybody's aware of the problems. It's not that nobody knows how to, uh, you know, but they have to see how those gaping holes, and it, it, it can't happen overnight. It's going to be a problem, uh, which they'll have to slowly and steadily prioritize and deal with it. Uh, as you know, they are on, IMF has given them, I think the third tranche should be in an, one of these days or whatever is probably in order. So, and they have, also, right. I mean, they, those tranche, the credit doesn't come in without some reforms and uh, other regulations being in place. Restructuring is required. I'm sure this interim government will be able to uh, deal with it uh, in, a, in a strong way. Yeah. So, I mean, in conclusion, so it may not just be the end of Hasina. She still hasn't, we still haven't decided whether she's going to uh, you know, stay on in India, or whether she's going to Brit move to Britain, where apparently her niece is a minister, is uh, works in the Commerce Ministry. I mean, she's 76 years old, so you know, after 15 years in office, uh, you know, tarred by charges of corruption, we don't know whether uh, she can make a comeback. And as you rightly say, Khalid Azia uh, has got, you know, is in poor health, so we don't know where uh, the BNP uh, is is going to, who is going to be led by whether it will be the son who comes back, uh, you know, and whether the, the students can actually stand up and actually, uh, you know, push for the kind of uh, change that is, uh, that Bangladesh is desperately needs. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Datta, for Thank coming you. in on the program. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was, it was, it's, it's quite an eye opener. This, you, you're, you're obviously, you obviously see, uh, you know, uh, tough times ahead, but some hope. Of tomorrow. Course. I'm very upbeat. Tough times ahead. But I'm sure, you know, as you mentioned, students are inexperienced. So, but the onus lies on the experienced people within the interim government to take this forward. But I'm very, very upbeat that uh, slowly and steadily things will fall in place. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Chaudhary. Uh, thank you, Professor Datta. Thank, thank you. you, viewers, for watching Global Express. Do click on the new Indian Express icon and watch and share the Global Express discussion on Hasina's very hasty exit.